Tanakotu Katoa. It's great to have you join us for our online meeting this morning. Once again, we find ourselves in, uh, in lockdown and unable to gather. So I hope that you've got some friends around you and you've been able to come together with some other people today to enjoy uh, this time of fellowship together. So, but whether you're with other people or by yourself, we pray that today you would hear God's voice and you would know his presence as we explore the scriptures together. Today we're going back to our series on the story of the Bible and Ken McLeod is going to come and bring us a word from the Bible around Mount Sinai. The great occasion when God spoke to a group of people for the first time and he had something amazing to share with them and Ken's going to unpack that with us this morning. But first let's go to a kids program and uh, explore Mount Sinai together through the eyes of our children. God bless. In our Bible journey so far, the Israelites have been rescued by God out of slavery in Egypt. Moses has led them through the Red Sea. God has shown them his mighty power. Now, three months later, with their families, young and old, and all their possessions, sheep and cattle, carrying or leading them as they needed to, they have finally reached the desert of Sinai, and the whole community has camped at the base of Mount Sinai. God calls Moses up the mountain and gives him a message for his people. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then you will be my treasured possession. Moses tells the people about God's promise. God calls him up the mountain again. This time, God comes down in fire and smoke. And while Moses is with God, he gives him the Ten Commandments. Ten basic rules for the Israelites to obey. What? Ten Commandments? How can I remember ten rules from God? I have a way to memorize the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one. You should have no other gods before me. God is number one. Commandment number two. You shall not make for yourself an idol and bow down and worship it. Commandment number three. Like a W to remember your words. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember your words. Commandment number four. Like a stop sign. Stop and rest. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Stop. Commandment number five. Honour your father and mother. Yes, mum. Yes, dad. Commandment number six. Do not murder. Commandment number seven, there are two people in a marriage, not five. Do not commit adultery. Commandment number eight, do not steal. In some countries they cut off your thumbs, in other countries they put you in prison. Do not steal. Commandment number nine, four is not five. Do not lie. Commandment number ten, do not want anything that belongs to anyone else. Do not cut it. Let's try it all together. Commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. God is number one. Commandment number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol and bow down and worship it. Commandment number three, like a W to remember your words. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember your words. Commandment number four, like a stop sign. Stop and rest. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Stop. Commandment number five, honour your father and mother. Yes, mum, yes, dad. Commandment number six, do not murder. Commandment number seven, there are two people in a marriage, not five. Do not commit adultery. Commandment number eight, do not steal. In some countries, they cut off your thumbs. In other countries, they put you in prison. Do not steal. Commandment number nine, four is not five. Do not lie. Commandment number 10, do not want anything that belongs to anyone else. Do not covet. Kia ora nui, kia ora hi. Nei rā te miti mihi atu. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto kato. Māori Language Week, so welcome, welcome, three times welcome to all of you. It's a beautiful thing about the Māori language, the way that the warmth of that welcome. And I hope you're feeling that in your lounge or wherever you are today. I'm Ken McLeod, I'm uh, relatively new to the Rangiora Church, uh, having spent the last 10 years in Hawke's Bay uh, as the Rector of Lindisfarne College, uh, a boys' school in the Hawke's Bay. 
My background is from Christchurch, however. My father was the minister at the Oxford Terrace Baptist Church, and uh, so I had lots of connections with Baptists through Christchurch and the country, and we lived here for quite a while. So uh, we've been here since the beginning of this year, and uh, it's great to be able to come and share something with you today. Well, we are, as most of you will be aware, partway through a series of the story of the Bible, or the Bible as a story. It's a story with real people with real events and with a very real God. And it began in the, the book of beginnings in Genesis and it ends with the book of Revelation. And we are part way along the story and as we go, we're seeing some key signposts, some moments that link together this incredible story. Well, this week we pick up the story in the book of Exodus after the miraculous escape of the Hebrew refugees through the Red Sea and then after they've had two very difficult months uh, in the desert, and they finally reach Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai is also called Mount Horeb. It's in the southeast corner of the Sinai Peninsula. It's a granite mass of rock, essentially, 2,285 metres. That's about the height of the mountains in Arthur's Pass, and it's part of a range of similar granite mountains. It's rugged, it's rocky, it's dry, it has an extreme climate. But Moses knew it quite well. He had grazed his sheep there. And it was here that he first encountered Yahweh in the burning bush. And the people were to spend a year camped there. And in this year at Sinai, God revealed three very significant things to them. They were gifts, really, to the people of Israel, that they were, they were to be significant for them and as key signposts in the story of the Bible, and therefore in our story. So let's read part of what happened. And if you have your Bible with you, and I hope you do, turn to Exodus chapter 19, where these events begin. And we'll read from verse 3. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and he summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him. And the people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. And so Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. And the Lord said, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking to you and will always put their trust in you. So Moses then told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not go up the mountain or even touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. He'll surely be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on him. With a man or animal, he should not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, May they go up the mountain. So after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes, and he said to them, Prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, with a thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp, to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. And smoke billowed up like smoke from a furnace. And the whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses up to him to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they don't force their way through to see the Lord, for many of them will perish. 
Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people can't come up Mount Sinai. You yourself warn us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. Well, the first thing in this remarkable story, and it's a pretty amazing event, we have to admit, was that God revealed himself. God spoke to the people. Now, this was actually quite new. Up until then, God had revealed himself in a personal way to individuals. But here for the first time, God spoke to an entire new nation. What did God reveal about himself? Well, first and foremost, he revealed his majestic power, his awesomeness. He revealed his voice and he revealed his holiness. In verse 9, God says, I'm going to come down in the dense cloud. The people will hear me speaking. And he does just that. He's revealed as powerful and holy and genuinely awesome and mighty. A cause of trembling and fear. And this thunder and lightning and this loud trumpet blast comes down from the mountain. Uh, and the sound of this trumpet gets louder and louder and louder. And Moses speaks and the voice of the Lord answered him. And everyone in the camp trembled. Now those of you who were perhaps were in Canterbury during the earthquakes can maybe get some concept of what that would have been like. What that experience might have felt like. How small and helpless you are in the face of this incredible power. See, our God is truly awesome. And coming down the mountain and speaking, God was taking the initiative to be known. And the Bible story from Genesis right through to Revelation is the story of God taking the initiative, reaching out to people and helping us know who he is. God also revealed on this day his holiness, that he was completely holy. And in the face of this holiness, there needed to be a boundary around the mountain because people would die if they entered and met this holy, holy God. In fact, the people had to spend two days consecrating and purifying themselves to even be near the mountain and then to hear his voice. So God's first gift really was that he revealed himself and he did so in an incredibly dramatic way. What does that teach us? What does it mean for you and I here in New Zealand today? Well, I think the first thing is that we can know him. He revealed himself. He's a God who wants to be known. And through the Old Testament accounts, and of course through the life of Jesus, he revealed himself. And who would not want to know a God like this? Secondly, Exodus 19 gives us two principles, if you like, or two prerequisites when we come to meet God and have him reveal more about himself. The first thing is that we need to be willing to obey fully. Verse 5, before God's revelation of himself to the people, he said, if you obey me and keep my commandment, then these things will happen. See, God sought a commitment to the covenant before he revealed himself fully. And the people at Sinai gave that. They responded to God's offer of this covenant and said, we will do everything the Lord has said. I'm sure, Kerry would love that to be a response at some of our church meetings. Interestingly, though, God didn't reveal exactly how they were going to obey, other than in quite a general way. You're going to be priests, you're going to be a holy nation. He didn't reveal that until after they had agreed uh, to it. And you and I can have some quite significant spiritual experiences in meeting God, probably not as dramatic as it at Mount Sinai. And in those moments, it's easy to say, yes, God, I'll obey you. But then we have to keep on obeying. You know, Jesus required the same thing. In John 14, 21, he said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will manifest myself to him. It's in keeping the commandments that are required for God to manifest himself. And for the Hebrews and for us, obedience is a decision of the will, not the emotions. We have high emotions, we have low emotions in life. Obedience is something we do regardless of how we feel. Eugene Peterson wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. It was a reminder to our Western culture with an instant desire for gratification. 
It often means, as Western Christians, too often we want a shortcut to maturity, a shortcut to holiness, a shortcut to leadership, a shortcut to being spiritual, a shortcut to knowing God. And Peterson reminds us in his book that we are pilgrims and disciples. To learn more of God requires a commitment, a long obedience in the same direction. There are no shortcuts to holiness. But praise God, we can safely obey because we trust in a God of love who carries us. Like the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, carried on eagles' wings. He has our best interests at heart. So to know God fully and more, we must firstly obey. Secondly, we learn from this event that we must consecrate ourselves. It's a word we don't use much these days, it's kind of old-fashioned. God was holy. The mountain, as a result, was holy too. And to hear God and to draw near to him, the Hebrews had to be holy also. Now, holiness and evil don't match up. Clean and dirty are mutually exclusive. And as we heard last week, <coughs> light and dark are just the same. The word consecrate literally means to make holy. And holiness means to be set aside for God. Now to be set aside for God is also a decision of our will. It's a conscious choice. The Apostle Paul knew this. When he wrote in Romans 12.1, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Consecration is setting aside all for God. That's our worship. Not the activities of doing church, but the giving of our lives. Now the problem, as you may have heard before, is that a living sacrifice can jump off the altar. We can slip a hand, a leg, a head off the altar. We can look elsewhere at things we shouldn't be looking at. We can hear things that we shouldn't be listening to. We can say things we shouldn't say. We can think about things that are not honouring to God. But we can't half consecrate. Being half dirty is not being clean, as my mother often would tell me. If we want to see and know and please God, we need to fully consecrate ourselves. When we came here today or in other days to worship, or when we come to meet with God, were we actually ready to meet with God? Have we set ourselves aside in holiness? Have we sought forgiveness of our sin? Are we ready to keep our promises and commitments to God? Are we living sacrifices? Did we come today with a deep respect for who God really is, ready to listen and obey? You know, in Sinai, there was a fear of the Lord. The awe of this holy God was so profound that no one would even touch the mountain. I think in contrast today, we often live in a time of a pitifully shallow concept of God. In our attempt to make God relevant and comfortable, we can easily cheapen and diminish the holiness and the greatness of God. The Bible tells us God is holy, the only wise God, the creator of the universe, the sovereign king of kings and lord of all. And when people come into God's presence in the Bible, or even into the presence of one of his messengers, they often were in awe. They trembled. They fell to their faces on the ground. They wouldn't even look. By contrast today, it often seems that God is seen as our mate, ever available at our call, someone to meet our needs, to make our lives easier, to make us happier. If we're not careful, our faith can become all about us and about God solving our problems not about the glory and the holiness of an almighty God, of a risen and glorified Jesus, of a holy God. Sinai reminds us, I think, that we need to get our focus right, that we need to develop a desire for holiness. J. Oswald Sanders, uh, in one of his books, says, as we mature spiritually, we see a growing desire to be holy rather than to be happy. Growing desire to be holy rather than be happy. What's your desire? Now it's also true, as we read in Hebrews 22, that we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Jesus, by his death on the cross, enables us to come to God. But that confidence does not diminish and should not diminish our humility, 
our awe, our reverence, our recognition of whom God really is. The one who is in heaven, surrounded by angels, saying, Holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. Could it be, in our casualness, that we've so distorted our understanding of God and our readiness to meet him, that we might offend him? A.W. Tozer, in his excellent book, The Knowledge of the Holy, it's a book about the characteristics of God, he puts it really well. He says, The heaviest obligation lying on the Christian church today is to purify and elevate the concept of God until it's once more worthy of him. Is your concept of God worthy of God? One of the great hymn writers of the 19th century was Frances Ridley Havergal. She was born in 1836. She died at just 43. She was a prolific writer, a poet, and a hymn writer. She wrote more than 60 hymns. She considered her talents as loans from God to be used in her service, consecrated, if you like. Her most famous and popular hymn is a hymn of consecration. Many of you will know it, but if you don't, you need to check it out. It's entitled, Take My Life. And it begins, Take my life and let it be, consecrated Lord to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. And as we reflect on what happened at Sinai and on God's revelation of himself, and if we are willing to obey and to meet God as he really is, we too will consecrate ourselves to him. We will be a holy living sacrifice. And this week I want to set you a little challenge to do something that Frances Havergal used to ask people when she spoke or sang. This week is an act of reflection or meditation. I want you to thoughtfully pray through one verse of her hymn each day of the week. Conveniently, there are six verses, Monday to Saturday, in preparation for coming to worship again. I guarantee it will challenge you, but it will be worth the effort as you reflect on who God is and our response of consecration. you find it easily on the internet. We may be able to email it out to you. So God's great gift at Sinai was to reveal himself as who he really was, to speak to all the people, and for them to understand what it was to know him. The second gift God gave was that he revealed his plan for the world and his purpose for the people of Israel. There were two parts to this. The first part was this covenant relationship. In verses 5 and 6, God offers this covenant, and the people agree to do it. Now, covenants were not uncommon in the ancient Middle East, and we're talking 12 to 1500 BC here. Some were conditional and some were not. God's covenant with Abraham, for example, was not conditional. God just promised to make him a, a huge nation, to have a multitude of descendants, that his name would be a blessing and to know him. This particular covenant that we looked at today, what's conditional? There's three, three things, three conditions. The first God said they must obey my voice. Secondly, they must keep my covenant. That's an ongoing commitment to obedience. And thirdly, they were to give soul allegiance to Yahweh. And we see that in the first of the Ten Commandments, and again in Exodus 34, verse 14. And then God said if they did that, out of all the nations, they would be my treasured possession. What a wonderful thing to be God's treasured possession said, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And a little bit further through in chapter 34, verse 10, there are some promises that expand on this. And he says, before all your people, I will do marvels such as not been, have not been seen in the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I shall do for you. That's a pretty wonderful offer. It's interesting, though, that the covenant did not promise Israel wealth or power or happiness or success. It promised them God's love, his presence, and that he would do great things among them. So God reveals his method, this covenant relationship where his treasured people would be a holy nation, a mechanism for the world to see the work of the Lord, and they would be so attracted by this that they would also want to come and serve him. And the people would act as priests and mediators. But what did it mean to be a holy nation? How were these people supposed to know, as Hebrews, how to be a holy nation? Well, the answer to that is that God gave the law. 
The provision of the law is seen in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and through the rest of the books of the, the Torah through to Deuteronomy. And we tend to see this big bunch of instructions, some very specific. As a youth, my favourite was Leviticus chapter 13, the sores of the flesh. Now, there's a challenging study for a Thursday night home group. Uh, and it was probably referring to leprosy and what to do with infected clothing. And we can see it as incredibly demanding and legalistic and a bit over the top, to be honest. And from our perspective, it seems worse because we see Jesus in the New Testament criticising the excesses of the Pharisees' interpretations and understanding of these laws. But the Torah means simply instruction and guidance. And they needed laws. The Hebrews had left Egypt with its oppressive laws of slavery on them and they'd come into the desert and they had no laws to live by. For them, these laws weren't a burden. They were actually really helpful. And we have many similar kinds of laws today. I'm sure our law book is much longer than that in the Bible. But these laws gave stability and certainty. They provided justice and social cohesion. And the laws were, for that time, inherently practical, and they were deemed just. What do you do if someone accidentally injures or kills someone? The laws were necessary and humane. Taking care for the poor, for the orphans and the widows, for laws... laws to protect foreigners, in other words, laws to, ta to make sure no one was taking advantage of the disadvantaged. Laws for health, laws for well-being, laws about their relationship with God, the first two of the Ten Commandments, one God, no idols. Laws about how to worship and about relationships with others and more. And God gave these laws because he wanted the nation to model for the world his character, his holiness, his love, his justice, and his mercy. It's interesting that the prophets in the Old Testament, when they cried out against the disobedience of Israel, weren't crying out about the detail of sacrifices or land rights or how far to walk on the Sabbath. They were there and criticising them because they weren't worshipping God. They weren't showing justice and mercy and care for orphans and widows. That wonderful verse in Micah 6 8 says, What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. And Jesus criticised the Pharisees over this too. He knew the law was external. Oh, it was a bunch of written down laws, but that their hearts were the problem. He came to abolish the law, not because it was a bad thing, and we've seen it was essentially very good and helpful, but to fulfil it, to actually do it, to live the life and demonstrate to the world what adherence to the law would look like. A life of love, of holiness of justice, of mercy, of sacrificial love for others. And if today we follow Jesus and we are led by the Spirit, the outcome will be love for God and genuine love for others, just what the law was all about. And this will be seen by others around us, by the world. If we too are a holy people, it will be attractive. It is attractive. So giving the Lord Sinai was part of God's method as a practical way to establish this holy nation as a light to the nations, not as a burden, but as a blessing and a guide. And through Jesus, he extended that task for us today. Well, finally, the third gift that God gives is that he, re he revealed the assurance of his presence. The book of Exodus is also known as the book of the presence of God. And we've seen how he made his presence known. His third gift was to reassure them that he would be with them into the future. And he did this in two ways. One, in the promise, and secondly, visually, through the tabernacle. Now, in the Old Testament, places of worship weren't meeting places like our churches today. They were usually altars that were set up at a spot where God had been revealed in a special way. And so it was deemed a holy place, the site of the burning bush. Mount Sinai were such places that still, Mount Sinai is still recognised in this way. They were sites where people could assume or know God's presence. And they saw it as a place where God intersected with their life and the world. The issue for the Hebrew people was that they were going to be in fulfilling Abram's covenant, moving from Sinai to Canaan, to the promised land. So God very graciously provided these instructions to Moses to build what was known as the tabernacle. It was a tent, essentially inside a small compound. The Ark of the Covenant was there, and in it were the Ten Commandments. And the tent was a place where God would allow his presence and glory to be made evident. 
And as we read in Exodus chapter 40, verse 36 to 38, when the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, they were moved. When it was there, they stayed. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and the fire in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. It was a visual sign that God lived among his people, that his presence would be with them. And we see this later in the story of the Bible, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. And we see and experience it further as the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So the tabernacle was this gift from God to assure his people that he was still with them. And it was a huge encouragement to the people. And God reinforced that commitment with a remarkable promise as they left for the promised land. In chapter 33, verse 14, he replied to Moses and said, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. When we walk with God, when we're in a close relationship with him, in his presence, we do know his rest and his peace, and we trust him. And God still reassures us of his presence with the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who dwells in us. And every day, every thought, every moment, the goods and the bads of life, we know that he is with us, and we are with him. And this omnipotent, holy God of love walks with you and I. And only in him will we truly find deep, deep joy and peace and rest. Now, we no longer have to go to a special place to meet God. We don't need to pray, God, come down and be with us today, because he's here. He's with you now at home. He comes with us because we are his tabernacles. And so in this book of Exodus, this book of the presence of God, we see God providing these three amazing gifts and revelations to his people. He revealed himself, his power, his holiness, as he spoke to the people. He revealed the way in which everyone would know him, a chosen, holy, covenant nation of priests following the law to make him known. And he revealed the assurance of his presence with them through the tabernacle. And we see these truths still here today. God reveals himself to you and to me. He wants us to be his witnesses and he assures us of his presence with us through the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So how will you, how will I, how will we as a church respond to these truths, to the Sinai experience and to this very same God? Will we each as individuals and corporately as a church take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee? Will we obediently offer our moments and our days in ceaseless praise as holy living sacrifices and loving witnesses for the awesome God that we serve. Let's pray together. Holy and mighty God, in whose presence we too should tremble, we pray that as you did so long ago for the people of Israel at Sinai, that you will continue to reveal yourself and speak to us in you. Help us to listen and to obey, so we'll know you as you truly are. Thank you that you've chosen us as your people to be priests and to be so consecrated to you that you will do great things among us and in us so that others may see and seek after you. And thank you that you've already revealed to us in your word through Jesus and through your spirit who reassures us and gives us rest. Help us as we consider this week what it means to take our lives and be truly consecrated, O Lord, to thee. Glory be to God. Amen.